want to thank this congregation for having me. Like, like he said, this is my first time here and I'm loving it. My parents have spoken very well of this congregation and, and have for years, and I'm thankful to have the opportunity to be able to be here. I've got a lot of material to cover, so I'm going to go ahead and launch in here. Um, homosexuality, not a very fun topic. And it's very unfortunate that we have to discuss this in this day and age. But any of you all that are parents, I want to give you a heads up because this can be a very mature theme and, and some parents get squeamish about this, especially if there are kids in the audience. So I usually like to give a little disclaimer about that. But if you're here, you know what the topic is. I think you're ready for what we're going to be covering. I use a lot of references for what we're about to cover, and, uh, but I don't cite them all in here. There's simply just not enough room on the slides to do that. If you're interested in those references, you can visit our website or contact me for some of that information. As you know, there's an abundant biblical evidence about the subject of sexual sin. The Bible has a lot to say about that. And uh, interestingly, specific certain uh, sexual sins are discussed in the Bible and told uh, about certain sins, if they become prevalent enough in a society, then these certain sins will cause a society to be punished by God. And Deuteronomy 9, chapter 4 tells us that that's the, the re, you know, why Canaan was being wiped out by the Israelites. It wasn't due to the Israelites' own um, you know, righteousness. It was due to the wickedness of Canaan. And then several of these specific sins are then listed in the Bible for us in order to help highlight for us the certain sins that if these things get out of control in a society, then God is going to step in. It's just a matter of time. Now, uh, perhaps not as repulsive as you might think bestiality is, although that's listed in those sins as well. But in my op opinion, potentially more dangerous than bestiality is this sin of homosexuality. Leviticus chapter 18, of course, speaks about homosexuality. You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It's an abomination. Do not defile yourselves with any of these things. For by all these things the nations are defiled, which I'm casting out before you. For the land is defiled, therefore I visit the punishment of its iniquity upon it, and the land vomits out its inhabitants. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, and shall not commit any of these abominations, either any of your own nation or any stranger who dwells among you. So this was in a list of other things, including homosexuality. Now why would I argue that this is so dangerous today. Well, consider a few excerpts from this repulsive article uh, written by Michael Swift back in 1987. This is known today as the Homosexual Manifesto. It's become kind of the, the, the trademark article. It's the, the gay agenda. Swift worked for a gay publication called Gay Community News. And portions of this article were actually read in Congress by former Congressman uh, William Dannemeyer, and it was actually entered into the congressional record. Here is what it says. Be ready. This is an essay, an outray, madness, a tragic, cruel fantasy, an eruption of inner rage on how the oppressed desperately dream of being the oppressor. We shall sodomize your sons emblems of your feeble masculinity, of your shallow dreams and vulgar lies. We shall seduce them in your schools, in your dormitories, in your gymnasiums, in your locker rooms, in your sports arenas, in your seminaries, in your youth groups, in your movie theater bathrooms, in your army bunkhouses, in your truck stops, in your all-male clubs, in your houses of Congress. Wherever men are with men together, your son shall become our minions and do our bidding." They'll be recast in our image. They will come to crave and adore us. All laws banning homosexual activity will be revoked. Instead, legislation shall be passed which engenders love between men. All homosexuals must stand together as brothers. We will triumph only when we present a common face to the vicious heterosexual enemy. We shall stage plays in which man openly caresses man. We shall make films about the love between heroic men. Our writers and artists will make love between men fashionable and de rigueur, and we will succeed because we're adept at setting styles. We will unmask the powerful homosexuals who masquerade as heterosexuals. You'll be shocked and frightened when you find that your presidents and their sons, your industrialists, your senators, your mayors, your generals, your athletes, your film stars, your television personalities, your civic leaders, your priests are not the safe, familiar, bourgeois, heterosexual figures you assume them to be. We are everywhere. 
We have infiltrated your ranks. Be careful when you speak of homosexuals because we're always among you. We may be sitting across the desk from you. We may be sleeping in the same bed with you. The family unit, spawning ground of lies, betrayals, mediocrity, mediocrity, hypocrisy, and violence will be abolished. The family unit, which only dampens imagination and curbs free will, must be eliminated. Perfect boys will be conceived and grown in the genetic laboratory. They will be bonded together in communal setting under the control and instruction of homosexual savants. All churches who condemn us will be closed. Our only gods are handsome young men. We adhere to a cult of beauty, moral and aesthetic. All that is ugly and vulgar and banal will be annihilated. Since we are alienated from middle class heterosexual conventions, we're free to live our lives according to the dictates of the pure imagination. For us, too much is not enough. The exquisite society to emerge will be governed by an elite comprised of gay poets. One of the major requirements for a position of power in the new society of homoeroticism will be indulgence in the Greek passion. Any man contaminated with heterosexual lust will be automatically barred from a position of influence. All males who insist on remaining stupidly heterosexual will be tried in homosexual courts of justice and will become invisible men. We shall rewrite history, history filled and debased with your heterosexual lies and distortions. We shall portray the homosexuality of the great leaders and thinkers who have shaped the world. We will demonstrate that homosexuality and intelligence and imagination are inextricably linked and that homosexuality is a requirement for true nobility, true beauty in a man. We too are capable of firing guns and manning the barricades of the ultimate revolution. Tremble, hetero swine, when we appear before you without our masks. Now again, that's a, a homosexual activist from 26 years ago. Does it sound to you like the goal is to recreate reincarnate Sodom in America today? That's what I see whenever I, whenever I read that. Does it sound to you like this agenda has been being carried out effectively for the last 25 years? It's my intention this morning to help, uh, or this afternoon, to help pinpoint just how effective this agenda has been being implemented. One of the most terrible things about the homosexual agenda is that the militant homosexual community is pushing, uh, that is pushing for change is clearly targeting children. Have you noticed that? Just like Hitler did. Hitler realized if he can gain the, the minds of young people, and it really doesn't matter if he converts the older people to his way of thinking, he's already got the next generation. The homosexuals have jumped on that, and their goal is to indoctrinate society into accepting the homosexual lifestyle. And as proof, consider the children books that have been released over the last several years. And this is just a sampling of them. There are many. In fact, there are so many that we at AP decided we, need to go ahead, we needed to go ahead and, and develop a book that addresses this at a child's level for those kids that are already being introduced to this at such a young age. We've got an article uh, by Eric Lyons on our website called Homosexuality in Public Education where he documents how much uh, the gay uh, community is trying to indoctrinate children. He brings out, for example... A California law concerning Harvey Milk Day. Did you hear about this? Uh, where this California law that was instated back in October 2009 uh, made May 22nd a, a gay day that public schools are expected to celebrate. Harvey Milk uh, was a 1970s homosexual activist that they believe should be honored right alongside Martin Luther King. July 14, 2011, a California bill was signed that, quote, according to CNN, requires public schools in the state of California to teach students about the contributions of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender Americans. So this is being shoved down our children's throats. And California, of course, leads the way in many ways. This was already two years ago. Others are following suit. Uh, it's, it's also probably been clear to you from the headlines in the recent months that uh, the homosexuals have been targeting the Boy Scouts, just like the, uh, the lesbians did with success with the Girl Scouts. Uh, statistically, uh, 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 it's known that 33% of the staff of the Girl Scouts is known to be lesbian. Now, their goal isn't just to, uh, to try to gain access to children to sexually abuse them. It's to indoctrinate them. That is the goal. But worse than that, just beyond this... this this goal of indoctrinating kids, gay activists are seeking also to gain sexual access to little boys and to do it in a legal way. 
uh, James Dobson, who wrote a great book called Bringing Up Boys, and he highlights this movement. He talks about NAMBLA, which is the North American Man-Boy Love Association. And he talks about how that is gaining influence. It promotes, uh, as, as its name implies, sex between men and children. Their motto is, uh, sex before eight or else it's too late. That's their motto, NAMBLA. There's a worldwide effort that gays are engaged in to try to lower the age of sexual consent, the age at which a a child can legally consent to intercourse with an adult. And the result has been to lower the age from 18, for example, to some of these um, following uh, ages up here. The United Kingdom down to 16. Sweden and France is down to 15. Canada, Germany, Iceland, Italy, and, and San Marino, Slovenia down to 14. Look at this, Spain, Holland, Malta, and Portugal, 12 years old. It's been brought down to 12 years old. Now notice that with many of these ages, the child hasn't even reached puberty. And yet, as uh, Dobson mentions, these kids, even though they haven't even reached puberty, they can give their consent to older men who want to use them sexually. And guess what? The parents can't do anything about it because it's legal. It's legal for that to happen. Now, why in the world would the gays be... Uh, so feverishly trying to lower the age at which kids can consent to this. Well, I think it's clearly in keeping with the gay agenda, that homosexual manifesto, that is clearly what they're wanting to do. I wanted to to show a timeline of American events, just a brief look at several of the, the key events that have happened over the years. I really left out probably half of what could have been put on here, but these are things that stood out to me. 1776, of course, from the inception of this country, sodomy was illegal in every state, and it was subject to punishment in all 13 colonies. Originally, the death penalty was to be given for homosexuality. Several of the states followed in that tradition, including New York, Vermont, Connecticut, South Carolina, and Virginia. Thomas Jefferson actually advocated dismemberment for homosexuality. Then, of course, in the 1960s, the big sexual revolution in America, where sexual exploration was encouraged and engaged in by young people across America. That laid the groundwork, even though homosexuality wasn't prevalent in the 60s, it laid the groundwork for the commencement of gay acceptance in the 70s. Uh, The civil rights movement of the 1960s also allowed the homosexual community to ride in on the coattails of the civil rights movement and the fight against racism. Many people mistakenly equated racism with having a problem with homosexuality, and that has been a very effective goal. June 28, 1969 was an important day uh, because some policemen in New York raided a gay bar known as Stonewall Inn. I I don't know how many of you all ever remember. I wasn't even born at this point, but this sparked some violent riots in response to this. And it was considered the event that sparked the gay liberation movement. One year later to the day, in 1970, the first gay pride marches took place in commemoration of that uh, Stonewall event. Then in 1971, All in the Family became the first TV sitcom to depict a gay character. Now, as you, you know as well as I how significant that is, the minute that started being put into TV and promoted as something normal and natural. 1972, the, uh, the Corner Bar becomes the first primetime TV sitcom to have a regular recurring gay character. That certain summer becomes the first major TV movie to deal with homosexuality. 1973, significantly, the American Psychiatric Association removed homosexuality from its list of mental disorders. It's no longer considered to be a mental disorder. Uh, The American Psychiatric Association, as of May 15th of this year, is actually headed by a homosexual named Dr. Saul Levin. 1975, the American Psychological Association followed suit and also uh, eliminated homosexuality from its list. They say on their website, quote, Since 1975, the American Psychological Association has called on psychologists to take the lead in removing the stigma of mental illness that has long been associated with lesbian, gay, and bisexual orientations. 1981, the first cases of AIDS were discovered in America, found at the time to be primarily linked to homosexuality. 159 cases were discovered in that first year. Today, homosexuals make up 61% of all new HIV infections today. 1982, Reagan implements a defense directive 
stating that, quote, homosexuality is incompatible with military service and that all the homosexuals and bisexuals were to be discharged from the military. 1983, Jerry Studs becomes the first openly gay person elected to Congress. And he uh, came out as a result, as some of you all may recall, as of an investigation into his relationship with a 17-year-old page. In April of 1986, Becky Smith and Annie Affleck of California became the first openly lesbian couple to be granted legal joint adoption of a child. That's obviously significant. June 30th, 1986, Bowers versus Hardwick, a Supreme Court case upheld in a five to four decision, very close, a Georgia sodomy law prohibiting homosexual activity. So it upheld that. February 1987, that homosexual manifesto was published. July 1987, uh, the uh, campaign America Responds to AIDS is launched by the Department of Health and Human Services uh, Center for Disease Control, attempting to raise awareness about AIDS. 1991, Simon LeVay's gay gene study is reported, announcing the finding of the alleged gay gene by the media. December 21st, 1993, Clinton's don't ask, don't tell policy, which you might remember, was implemented in the military, effectively allowing gays to serve in the military, but prohibiting them, remember, from disclosing their sexual orientation or being asked about it. December 24th of that year, three days later, the movie Philadelphia was released to theaters about a homosexual who contracts AIDS, and it was, uh, had a Tom Hanks and Denzel Washington in it. It grossed over $206 million and was nominated for five Academy Awards and wins two. September 21st, 1996, President Clinton signs DOMA, the Defense of Marriage Act, banning federal uh, recognition of same-sex marriage and defining marriage as, quote, a legal union between one man and one woman as husband and wife. 1997, New Jersey becomes the first state to expressly authorize joint adoption by gay couples. January of 2003, AIDS had become an epidemic in the United States, and in, a, in the State of the Union address, address, George W. Bush announces his emergency plan for AIDS relief. June 26, 2003, this is a day of infamy, and Lawrence, Lawrence versus Texas, U.S. Supreme Court in a 6-3 to three decision struck down all state sodomy laws that had been in force since the inception of this country. May 17, 2004, Massachusetts becomes the first state to legalize same-sex marriage. Uh, the first homosexual couple in America is married. J January 13th, 2006, the movie Brokeback Mountain in theaters, and it was nominated for eight Academy Awards. And catch this, it's the 12th highest grossing romance film of all time. 2010, the number of Americans who considered homosexuality morally acceptable climbed above 50% for the first time according to a Gallup poll. February 23rd, 2011, the Obama administration instructs the Justice Department to stop defending the constitutionality of DOMA, the Defense of Marriage Act, in court. September 30th, 2011, the U.S. Department of Defense issues new guidelines allowing military chaplains to perform same-sex ceremonies. December 18th, 2011, was the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell in the military, allowing, therefore, openly gay individuals now to serve in the military. May 9th, 2012, President Barack Obama openly, publicly endorses same-sex marriage. You may remember that last year. The first such statement by a sitting president, he feels that the legal decision should be up to the states to, de to determine. ABC News, um, he said, uh, I think same-sex couples should be able to get married. May 31st of 2012, the first U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals in Boston rules that the Defense of Marriage Act discriminates against gay couples. July 2012, Macklemore and Lewis's song uh, called Same Love is released. It's the first top 40 song to promote and celebrate same-sex marriage. October 18th of last year, the second U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals rules that DOMA violates the Constitution's Equal Protection Clause. August 30th, 2012, California is the first state to sign a ban on homosexual conversion therapy. 
to try to, basically, you can no longer give therapy to homosexuals to try to help them change to heterosexual. June 26th of this year, the Supreme Court rejects parts of DOMA in a 5-4 to four decision. Same-sex spouses legally married may now receive federal benefits. It overturns California's voter-approved ballot measure to bar homosexual couples from marrying. August 29th of this year, the U.S. Treasury Department rules that legally married same-sex couples will be treated as married for tax purposes, even if they live in a state that doesn't recognize same-sex marriage. And, of course, the current status, not only is homosexuality considered acceptable by and large, but same-sex marriage is legal now in 14 U.S. states and the District of Columbia. Same-sex marriage is banned by constitutional amendment or state law in 36 states, but civil unions are legal in three of those states. Of course, you know, almost every uh, television show now has homosexuality portrayed. It even has the token token homosexual or homosexual couple. Uh, Consider, for example, this timeline. Again, you know as well as I how how critical TV has been in this movement. Look at this uh, timeline of shows depicting homosexuals uh, since the 1970s. Now, this isn't a, uh, a list of all the shows that have brought homosexuality out of the closet and cast a positive light on it. It's just the ones that I could find. Notice in the 80s, there was about seven, but then in the 90s, notice how many all of a sudden broke out, which this, of course, was after the Homosexual Manifesto was released and after the Gay Gene Study was released in 1991, two very important events. By the time I got to the year 2000, I stopped even being able to find lists because about every show has something. So I just gave up on reporting all those shows and just listed a few of the the more prominent, just disgusting shows about this. According to the Huffington Post, as of October of this year, there were 46 lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender regular characters being broadcasted on TV in primetime shows today. 46. And some of the homosexual community is upset about that because those numbers are slipping. It's not that there's a fewer number. Last year there were 31 characters, fewer characters. But they note that that was 4.4% of actors that were appearing regularly on primetime uh, network drama and comedy series. Now, even though there's 46 characters, that represents only 3.3% of all characters. Question. Why in the world are people allowing this? Why are there so many people jumping on the bandwagon to legalize all forms of homosexuality and even encouraging it? Well, there's definitely different factors, but, but think about it. It's, it's significant that uh, even many so-called Christians and very conservative people are jumping on the bandwagon, and that, that's significant. For one, I would say we've become very desensitized to this subject as the TV shows you know, highlight. It's been shoved down our throat for years now. We've been, uh, we've been pushed day in and day out to get comfortable with homosexuality and to believe that it's, that it's normal and it's okay. It's nothing to be concerned about. It's natural that we should be tolerant and accepting of it. Just live and let live uh, about this sin. Just let it go. Be compassionate about it. So bottom line is we've been brainwashed. That's what's happened. We've been brainwashed. But beyond that, we've been conditioned uh, to have sympathy for homosexuals due to, for example, the AIDS epidemic and the way that homosexuals are portrayed in movies like Philadelphia and Brokeback Mountain and so forth, TV, uh, TV as well. So it's a, it's a widely known tactic that if gaining sympathy is one of the most effective ways of pushing an agenda. We know that. And they have been very effective. But also we've been told time and again that homosexuals cannot help it. They were born that way. The explosion of shows depicting homosexuals after that gauging study was released is not coincidental. If you hear something a thousand times by hundreds of people, it must be right, right? Well, the media has been very rash and irresponsible in giving the mistaken impression to the public that science has discovered this gay gene, and that, therefore, that proves that God must surely be okay with it, right? Since he made them that way, after all, right? It, it can't be wrong if God made them that way. Howard Dean, who was then the governor of Vermont, signed a bill legalizing same-sex uh, civil unions in Vermont, and this is what he said uh, on the, in, in the Washington Post. The overwhelming evidence is 
that there's a very significant, substantial genetic component to homosexuality. From a religious point of view, if God had thought homosexuality is a sin, he would not have created gay people. And that, of course, is a very widespread mentality you know that people have. I would be very shocked if there were not people in this room right now that have been influenced by that type of mentality. But guess what? April 14, 2003, the International Human Genome Consortium announced that the Human Genome Project was finished. The human genome had been mapped, and guess what was not found? The gay gene. Now, wait a minute. What about all these studies, though, that have proved that there is a gay gene, that it's genetic? Like, again, Simon LeVay's big study in 1991. Didn't he find uh, the gay gene and prove that there are brain differences between homosexual men and heterosexual men? LeVay's study found that there, there's clusters of these certain kinds of neurons called INAH in heterosexual men in the brain, and they're much, they're much larger in heterosexual men than they are in homosexual men and women. That seems pretty significant, so maybe homosexuals are born that way. That's how it was pushed to the public. But there's problems with that study. Number one, his results have never been able to be reproduced by anyone. That's significant. That's a key element of scientific study that helps to verify it because if only one person can do it, then chances are something is fishy. Number two, the homosexual men that were examined all died of complications from AIDS. And AIDS is known to decrease testosterone levels, thus yielding smaller clusters of INAH. So the size difference could have simply been due to AIDS rather than homosexuality. Number three, LeVay didn't have a complete medical history of the individuals in his study, which is, again, a critical component in a study where controls and standards are essential. So he had to make assumptions that corrupted his results. Number four, many scientists significantly are arguing that brain differences can be a result of certain behaviors rather than the cause of those behaviors. Mark Breedlove of UC Berkeley has shown that sexual behavior affects the brain. He says, quote, these findings give us proof for what we theoretically know to be the case, that sexual experience can alter the structure of the brain, just as genes can alter it. It's possible that differences in sexual behavior cause, rather than are caused by, differences in the brain. Obviously, you can see that would be a significant scientific find. Number five, LeVay himself is homosexual, which helps you to see what bias may be going on, why nobody's been able to reproduce this uh, study that he did. He said, quote, I felt if I didn't find any difference in the hypothalamuses, I would give up a scientific career altogether. So clearly he set out with an agenda in mind to find uh, the differences, not to answer the question of whether they even exist. Number six, LeVay said, quote, it's important to stress what I didn't find. I did not prove that homosexuality is genetic or find a genetic cause for being gay. I didn't show that gay men are born that way, the most common mistake people make in interpreting my work. Nor did I locate a gay center in the brain. So he didn't even actually claim to find the gay gene, and yet the media reported that way, and it had a significant impact. What about Bailey and Pillard's twin studies? They studied twins from homosexuals. Now consider... If homosexuality is in fact uh, genetic, then if an identical twin brother inherited homosexuality, then the other brother should be homosexual too. But guess what? They were not. And about half of the time, one brother was not homosexual, indicating that environment rather than genes are the cause, playing a significant role. Dean Hamer's study allegedly linking the male homosexuality with the X chromosome but the problem with his study is that, again, of reproducibility. Others have attempted similar studies and not been able to get the results Hamer did. Uh, when Rice and his colleagues uh, studied the X chromosome in question in 1999 uh, using a much larger sample of families, they found that their results were significantly different from Hamer's. They said, quote, it's unclear why our results are so discrepant from Hamer's original study, because our study was larger than that of Hamer. We certainly had adequate power to detect a genetic effect as large as was reported in that study. Nonetheless, our data do not support the presence of a gene of large effect influencing sexual orientation at position XQ28. The same problem was found from the University of Chicago psychiatrist Alan Sanders and his study of this same X chromosome concerning the alleged uh, linkage in homosexual Sanders' team found that the results were not statistically significant in proving this linkage. So in summary, in the words of evolutionary geneticists William Rice, 
um, Urban of Freiburg and Sergei Gavrile of UC Santa Barbara, Uppsala University in Sweden, and UT Knoxville. This was last year. This is what they said, quote, Although pedigree studies indicate a familial association of homosexuality in both males and females, which indicates, again, environmental influences, not genetic, more than a decade of molecular genetic studies have produced no consistent evidence for a major gene or other genetic marker contributing to male homosexuality. Moreover, the most recent genome-wide association study using exceptionally high marker density found no significant association between homosexuality in males and any SNPs. Now, Rice and his colleagues haven't given up hope. They admit that all of the scientific evidence to date has not revealed a gay gene. Uh, so they've proposed maybe homosexuality isn't genetic. Maybe it's epigenetic. Uh, last year, they published a paper that proposed a, a model for that possibility that there could be what they call epimarks that could account for homosexuality. But notice that's not actual evidence. This is just a new model to kind of basically give up on the whole genetic idea and try to go a different route. They've developed this new model to kind of start a new kind of search uh, since they couldn't find this gauging. Not actual testing. No such epimarks have been found. Just speculation and hopeful dreaming. They admit, quote, Although we cannot provide definitive evidence that homosexuality has a strong epigenetic underpinning, we do think that available evidence is fully consistent with that conclusion. Now, all of that said, consider, even if homosexuality were genetic, all that would be proved is that there is a genetic predisposition to be attracted to the same sex sexually. That's all it would prove. It would not prove that a person must necessarily act on that, that he couldn't and shouldn't control it if God insists on it. If a rape gene or a murder gene were ever discovered... Would society say, okay, they can't help it, so just let them go. Let them do what they want to do and kill people. Well, of course, we would recognize that that needs to be controlled. They need to control themselves. But also significantly, homosexuality, uh, homosexuals can change their orientation, which proves that this is not a genetic issue. A person born with certain illnesses, uh, like Down syndrome or, or diabetes, uh, you don't have the ability to change yourself if that is the case. A person cannot, or, but a person can change his sexual orientation, and many people do, which is strong evidence against the idea that this is an inheritable type of thing. If it's in the genes, you cannot change it. Robert Spitzer is the very man who led the movement to remove homosexuality from the Psychiatric Manual of Disorders. He conducted a study and concluded that actual orientation, not just behavior, but actual orientation is changeable for some. He said, quote, Like most psychiatrists, I thought that homosexual behavior could be resisted, but that no one could really change their sexual orientation. I now believe that's untrue. Some people can and do change. Now, if they can change, then it's not genetically required that someone be gay. Science to date is clear about homosexuality. There's no evidence that it's genetic and that you're forced to be that way, which means the evidence still stands in favor of it being environmentally caused, a choice. The Bible, of course, is also clear on this subject. There's an excellent article on our website on the biblical perspective on, of homosexuality uh, called The President and Homosexuality. I wanted to briefly talk a little bit about some of that material under the patriarchal period. We, of course, know that God created Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, not Eve and Ellen. And that is significant. God's plan for the home and romance was laid out at the beginning. He intentionally made a female for Adam. And we know that it was intentional because the text lays out three divinely listed criteria that Eve met for Adam. And that's significant. Number one, it wasn't good for man to be alone, Genesis 2.18. He needed someone to be with. And God did not pick another male to fit that niche. Instead, male and female, he created them, Genesis 1, Matthew 19. Number two, he needed a helper. And the helper needed to be suitable or fit for him, chapter 2, verse 18 and 20. Again, another male was not considered suitable for him in the way that God wanted. There needed to be a counterpart to make the puzzle pieces fit. Number three, the human race needed to be perpetuated through sexual activity. Genesis 1, Obviously, homosexuality will not work for that. It goes against the natural created order. 
Also in the patriarchal period, you have Genesis 19 and the Sodom and Gomorrah incident. You know about that story and, and how scary such an environment would be to live in. And the same kind of idea that the homosexual manifesto seems to want to create. After cries to God go up um, about the wicked state of affairs in Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding city, God, remember, sends angels to witness what is going on. And it says in Genesis 19, 4 through 5, Now before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both old and young, all the people from every quarter, surrounded the house, and they called the lot and said to him, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them carnally. You, of course, know what went down after that happened, and it wasn't a pretty picture. Now some have actually tried to explain this passage away. And to argue, you know, God wasn't really upset with homosexuality. It was, it was the rape element. God had a problem with the rape, not the homosexuality. And there's all kinds of, of different twists people try to, to, to make on this. But when you examine the text a little bit closer, it eliminates all of these arguments that are being brought up. Uh, why, for example, if the issue was rape, would Lot seek to offer his daughters to be gang raped instead of these visitors? Um, if that was going to somehow solve the problem that he knew was going on. All attempts to explain away the Bible's message about homosexuality fail. But notice two things about the text here in Genesis 19 that I think are important. Genesis 19 verse 8 says, this is Lot speaking, he says, Only do nothing to these men since this is the reason they have come under the shadow of my roof. So what the men were doing was the reason the angels were coming. Now notice this indicates that God will destroy a society if homosexuality is rampant enough. That is the reason the angels came under the shadow of, of Lot's roof. So they came to Sodom and Gomorrah because of the prevalence of homosexuality. Also notice in verse 9 of Genesis 19, uh, this is um, the men speaking to Lot, the homosexuals speaking to Lot. Here's what they said. Stand back. And they said, this one came in to stay, stay here, and he keeps acting as a judge. Now we'll deal worse with you than with them. How many times have you heard that allegation today? You're being judgmental. You know, who are you to tell somebody else what's right and wrong? That's what Lot was doing. And the same argument was used against Lot that is used today. People don't change. It's the same mentality today that they had back then. It's just ironic to me. Under the Mosaic period, remember we already saw that homosexuality was condemned in Leviticus 18, where God even warned the Israelites that uh, that was one of the sins that was causing entire nations in Canaan to just be wiped out using the Israelites. But also notice in Leviticus 20 that not only is it sinful, but it warranted the death penalty under the Mosaic period. Under the New Testament period, you have 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Do, not, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither homosexuals nor sodomites will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. The word for homosexual here, you can't get around it. It actually is the word for catamite, a male who submits his body to another male for unnatural lewdness. The word for sodomite here is a person who engages in sex with a male as with a female. Notice two relevant implications of this passage. Notice Paul says, do not be deceived. That's significant. Paul is, is marking the, down the fact that you will tend to be deceived about this issue and overlook it like this isn't a big deal. He says, don't be deceived. These people will not inherit eternal life. Also, he says, such were some of you. And that is a, a divine statement that this is not a matter of genetics. The practice of homosexuality is a choice that a person can repent of, just like the Corinthians did. Now, lest there be any confusion over the terms, Paul describes the practice in Romans 1, 26 through verse 32. For this reason God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another. Men with men, committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, who, knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those 
who practice them. Notice number one, this is a New Testament endorsement of capital punishment for homosexuality. You catch that? They're deserving of death, along with those other kind of sins that are listed there. Number two, also notice that this condemns those who approve of those who practice homosexuality, not just those that engage in it. So advocating the right to things that will encourage homosexuality in a civilization. That's what he's talking about. The right to civil unions or gay marriage. Advocating toleration of homosexuality. Just, just let it flourish in a society. Now, any kind of sin would be under the same, uh, the same idea of God not being okay with that. Speaking out against Chick-fil-A or the Boy Scouts and the stand they're doing uh, instead of encouraging them and standing with them. Voting for those who are actively promoting this kind of wicked behavior. Those who do those kind of things are, in essence, showing approval for the homosexual lifestyle. They're being deceived, like Paul said, and they're taking a stand with not with God. That leaves the devil. They're taking a stand with Satan and against God's wishes. 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 6 says that if you've got real love, it's not going to rejoice in wrongdoing. It's going to rejoice in the truth. So the people that claim that they're being loving by you know, accepting this and not speaking out and standing against it. They're not doing what the Bible calls love because love does not do that. Proverbs 27.5 says that it would be better to openly rebuke than carefully conceal love. You know, open rebuke about something is better than love carefully concealed. To not say anything, it'd be better to just openly take care of the issue because that's going to be more helpful to these people. We care about their soul. We want them to know, and we want others to know that this is not something to be promoted. You know, it's claimed by many people. You've probably heard a similar statistic. One in ten people are gay. Ten percent of people are gay. And that leaves the impression homosexuality, hey, that's pretty widespread, and we should be looking at it as as normal and even natural. But guess what? That percentage is simply not true. In 2010, according to census.gov, there were 594,000 same-sex couple households. That's less than 1% of the population, less than 1% of households. Now, in truth, that number would be expected to start to rise and quickly because um, gay, being gay is in vogue, it's popular, and since pedophilia is on the rise, which is known to instigate homosexuality in many cases, I'll talk about that in a moment, uh, many fathers have checked out of the home which again inflates homosexual numbers and, and young people are young confused students are being told by school counselors across the nation now to just embrace homosexuality if they're confused. Now, but what's more alarming, of course, and notable are the findings of that 2010 Gallup poll that indicates that over 50% of Americans approve of the homosexual lifestyle rather than condemn it. A society cannot survive with that kind of flagrant disregard for sin. And God can't tolerate a society with such rampant uh, sin. And, um, and in fact, he destroys such societies according to Deuteronomy chapter 9 and verse 4. As God said, through Paul, we shouldn't approve of those who practice homosexuality, whether by our actions or our inactions. Bottom line, science doesn't support homosexuality. The Bible is clear in its condemnation of homosexuality, but I didn't want to end today without talking about the psychological ramifications of this as well. According to the American Psychological Association, what causes the person to have a particular sexual orientation? There is no consensus among scientists about the exact reasons that any individual develops a heterosexual, bisexual, gay, or lesbian orientation. Although much research has examined the possible genetic, hormonal, developmental, social, and cultural influences on sexual orientation, no findings have emerged that permit scientists to conclude that sexual orientation is determined by any particular factor or factors. Many think that nature and nurture may um, both play com- complex Role. So in other words, a lot of study has been done and no one's found this gay gene. It can't be said to be hereditary or genetic. So it is a decision and a psychological issue in spite of the fact that the American Psychological Association has removed it from its list of mental disorders. Now, from my own studies, I gather that there's basically two distinct types of homosexuals. And we should make a distinction, I think, in our mind. There are those who have so indulged the flesh that natural intercourse is no longer appealing to them. 
They need something else to arouse themselves. I believe that's what's alluded to in Romans 1. And that'd probably be the type described in Genesis 18 and 19 and what you hear about uh, going on in prisons. But then there's those that have had something traumatic happen, happen to them that has caused confusion about their gender. And they need help. And Christians should be ready to do so. And I want to talk for a few moments about that kind of homosexual. I want to recommend a book to you called A Parent's Guide to Preventing Homosexuality. I actually brought a copy of it, forgot to bring it up here. Nicolosi is a, has a PhD in psychology and was the former president of the National Association for the Research and Therapy of Homosexuals. And this is something that is becoming fewer and far between people that still recognize this as something that needs therapy. He was also the founder and director of the Thomas Aquinas Psychological Clinic in California. He identifies something called gender identity disorder, which can begin to show itself, according to Nicolosi, as early as two years old. In males, this arises due to a child not being drawn into his own gender. He's rejected by his gender or things happen that cause him to essentially reject his own gender. Uh, Maybe the mom berates men, especially the father. Uh, Maybe a boy isn't coordinated enough to fit in with other boys. He's made fun of by other boys. Uh, Maybe circumstances happen that just cause him to begin to feel on the outside of his gender. He feels that he fits in better with females and the mother welcomes him in to the female gender and encourages feminine activity and behavior. This is again all according to Nicolosi. If the boy becomes distanced from the father or the father distances him, his father being his primary source of masculine image, his father or a father figure, then his feelings of rejection will cause him to not want to be like his father, which causes him, according to Nicolosi, to surrender his, quote, natural masculine strivings. Then when other boys shun the gender-confused boy, as indeed they will, they become more deeply mired in loneliness. And this loneliness and rejection only confirms their belief in their not being good enough. This leads to the problem of idolizing other boys' maleness, end quote. Then when those hormones hit in the adolescent years, uh, one gay psychologist said, quote, individuals become erotically or romantically attracted to those who were dissimilar or unfamiliar to them in childhood, end quote. So the exotic, he says, becomes erotic. So in other words, this boy who's not been drawn into his own gender, he fits in better with girls, he begins to look at boys as the mysterious opposite. And he idolizes them in their masculinity. When those hormones hit, that opposite that they've longed to be has added erotic feelings uh, uh, due to these hormones leading to homosexual feelings and behaviors. Notice this is, this is significant and, and Christians need to be aware of this because we're going to have to deal with it and we're going to have to be able to talk to people about this. In females, he notes that it's a little bit different. He says, quote, the girl's unconscious rejection of her feminine identity. Women who have become lesbians have usually decided on an unconscious level that being female is either undesirable or unsafe. Uh, Concerning gender identity disorder, the evidence indicates that fathers play a significant role in causing it and preventing it. Nicolosi notes, quote, in 15 years, I've spoken with hundreds of homosexual men. Uh, perhaps there are exceptions, but I've never met a single homosexual man who said he had a close, loving, and respectful relationship with his father. He says, the majority of fathers of pre-homosexual boys I've known are simply uninvolved, emotionally distant, and disconnected, especially from their sons. And he cites published works of other psychologists to confirm that. Psychologist Seymour Fisher and Roger Greenberg said, quote, The reports concerning the male homosexual's view of his father are overwhelmingly supportive of Freud's hypothesis. With only a few exceptions, the male homosexual declares that father has been a negative influence in his life, end quote. And that shows that while there are some inconsistencies in studies about mothers, um, he says, quote, one virtually unchanging variable is the poor relationship with fathers. So fathers affect homosexuality. Sexual abuse, as you may already know, can play a major role as well. Sexual molestation as a child makes you three times more likely to identify yourself as gay or lesbian. Uh, One study a few years ago found that 46% of homosexual men and 22% of lesbian women reported homosexual molestation, while only 7% of heterosexual men and 1% of heterosexual women reported homosexual molestation. This highlights the effect of homosexual molestation causing sexual identity. So parents should be on guard about this, watching our kiddos carefully. According to the director of the Crimes Against Children Research Center, 20% of adult females... 20% of adult females, 5 to 10% of adult males recall a childhood sexual assault 
or sexual abuse incident. Over the course of their lifetime, 28% of U.S. youth ages 14 to 17 had been sexually victimized. Isn't that number staggering to you? According to a 2003 National Institute of Justice report, three out of four adolescents who were sexually assaulted, 75%, were victimized by someone they knew well. Now, based on God's word, we can know homosexuality is a sin, and those who engage in it will be punished with eternal punishment along with all other sinners. Homosexuality is a choice to disobey God. It's not genetic. Now, that said, it's certainly true that God loves all sinners, and he expects Christians to do that as well, regardless of the specific sin that they may have committed. Any sin will separate you from God. It will cause spiritual death, no matter how minor we might consider that to be, James 2.10. So we're all in the same boat in that sense, and it shouldn't, uh, it shouldn't be looked down on. Homosexuality, we shouldn't look down on someone, lest we also be tempted, Galatians 6.1. As with any other sin, however... We as Christians must be doing our part to encourage others to repent of sin, no matter what that sin might be. In fact, if we don't do our part to confront sin, the Bible makes it clear, we'll be accountable as well. Homosexuality will bring punishment. But uh, also, very quickly, I wanted you to keep in mind, um, besides the danger of punishment, there's another important thing to keep in mind about refraining from sin in any form. And that is the fact that sin is for, uh, refraining from sin is for our own good. The Bible's clear about that. God's rules are for our benefit in the same way a parent's rules are supposed to be for the benefit of their children. Homosexuality will not bring the kind of happiness that God desires of us, so it is prohibited. And so there's statistics that make it clear that that is the case. Disease, for example, with regard to AIDS. The Center for Disease Control is causing, calling AIDS an epidemic. According to AIDS.gov, um, the homo- gays and bisexuals and other men who have sex with men remain the population most severely affected by HIV. 2009-2010, homosexuals accounted for 61% of all new HIV infections in the U.S. Um, young black homosexuals are the group most severely affected by HIV. So it's not, it's not for our good. So it's prohibited. Also, suicide. Mark uh, Hatson Bueller writing in the Journal of the American Academy of Pediatrics. In 2011, he, he did a study on 31,852 11th graders, and 21.5% of the homosexuals in the previous 12 months of that survey had attempted suicide. Summing it up, Nicolosi says, when the studies are taken as a whole, it is clear that a teenager who self-identifies as gay is high risk for infection with HIV or another sexually transmitted disease, for psychiatric problems, including suicidal ideation, and for self-destructive behavior, such as drug and alcohol abuse and prostitution. The fact that these problems do not decrease in gay-friendly cities, such as San Francisco, and gay-tolerant countries, such as the Netherlands, supports the view that there must be factors at work that are intrinsic to the homosexual condition. Bottom line, there's a reason God doesn't want mankind to engage in this sin. It's not good for you. And if we love people, We will discourage the practice in every way we can, and we'll try to help those people that are struggling with this. God has spoken about homosexuality. Thank you for your attention.